now Christopher Hitchens of Vanity Fair magazine. He spoke Friday about his magazine and his article on former White House intern Monica Lewinsky and about alternative weekly news magazines. His comments are part of the Association of Alternative News Weekly's 21st annual convention and last about an hour 15 minutes. Um, first of all, welcome to uh, we have C-SPAN here today and hopefully the microphone works better. Um, we have someone to make sure that the mics don't squeak like that. Anyway, our speaker today is uh, Christopher Hitchens, who's a contributing editor of Vanity Fair. Mr. Hitchens also writes a column for The Nation, and he uh, has informed me that he, this month, will have been there, or, or write, have, will have been writing that column now for 16 years at The Nation. He also contributes to a, a number of other publications. He's the author of several books, and perhaps is best known for his, uh, his books that took critical examinations of Princess Diana and Mother Teresa. He is smart, articulate, independent, and fearless, and as such embodies the virtues that we as alternative journalists uh, highly value. And he is here today to answer the question, are alternative newspapers doing their job? Mr. Hitchens? Thank you, Richard. Very handsome introduction. I know that um, Jennifer Flowers once entered a Marilyn Monroe look-alike contest, and I feel a bit as she must have felt, following as I do, immediately on a sp speech and presentation by Cy Hirsch, who has always been uh, one of the one of the terms I don't propose to use today is role model, um, but has always been a, a a real example to anyone who wants to use the power of words and language and reason for the purposes of uh, justice and um, democracy. And also just for the pleasure of seeing the wind let out of certain major bags. Um, no, um, no animals will be harmed in the making of this speech, but certain other phrases will not be used either. Uh, role model is one. Fragile truce, I won't say. Emerging consensus will not appear. <laughs> Bipartisan agreement, I don't propose to lean on very much either. I have a great friend in um, Jerusalem called uh, Israel Shahak. He used to be the professor of um, chemistry at the Hebrew University. Very lucky to be alive. He was very nearly put an end to in Poland in his youth. He's the founder of the Israeli League for Human and Civil Rights. He's one of the great moral figures of our time, in my opinion. I call him up every now and then and say, Israel, how are things going? And he says, well, Still sounds Polish. As well, there are encouraging signs of polarization. <laughs> <laughs> I, I call him quite often, actually, because living in Washington, I often feel I need to be reminded that that's true. That polarization isn't something to be feared, that polarization and the dialectic are what clarify things. You often hear people say, tending to pull out their noses or perhaps their chins, you know, well, really, some of these things you've written generate more. Um, more heat than light. It's always a safe thing to say, you know. Ridiculous bloody thing to say. Where do they think light comes from? What is the source of all light? The source of all light is heat. People don't even listen to the cliches on which they rely anymore. <laughs> if they could only hear themselves speak, but of course they don't, because they're pundits. They are, they are transmitters and not receivers. That's half the problem of all journalism. It's particularly uh, a great problem in uh, this our fair city, the nation's capital. Uh, now, when I first came to the United States, which was at the end of the 60s, I boarded a Greyhound bus and went all around the country looking for trouble, which was actually easier to find then, only slightly easier then to find than it, than it is now. It's always there if you know where to look. And one of the many things that impressed me about the United States was that everywhere I got off the bus, almost, there was what you could call an alternative newspaper. You could pick up if you were in Atlanta, there were great names to some of them, too. The Great Speckled Bird was the one in Atlanta, some of you probably remember. Uh, in Chicago, Rising Up Angry, particularly good one, um, a paper with attitude. Uh, the Barclay Burb, the, East, the Barclay Burb, the Barclay Barb. Um, the East Village Other, um, I don't want to sound nostalgic, there's been, there's been a lot of slightly slushy stuff about the 60s this year, but this was for real. Um, and you could tell by its language and its presentation that it was for real as well. <coughs> It had a language of anger, and generous anger, but real anger, and uh, contempt. Oh, I think the essential ingredient in the journalistic 
makeup, uh, one, of the, one of the hard counterparts of skepticism. It had solid news, and it had a lot of, a lot of moxie. Um, I'm not nostalgic for the psychedelic design. I've never been able to read white on red very easily, uh, purple on yellow, things like that. But there was, some, there was some artistry in there, too. Those of you who remember the comics of R. Crumb, for example, or who come to know them later or remember them from the time, will, will, will know that knew, knew what we saw when we saw them for the first time, that there was artistry in this movement as well. There were people who were really uh, creative and who really genuinely felt that they'd been fooled and lied to and exploited and bullied by the uh, forces of unconstituted authority and really meant to do something about it, did not want to leave, lead their lives that way and knew they didn't have to, no one could make them. Now this um, efflorescence of um, radical independent journalism, which was nationwide as well as local and was connected and coordinated and run by some very brave people, was destroyed as we all know. It didn't go into a decline, it didn't sink giggling into the sea, it didn't wig out on drugs or any of this kind of thing. It was broken up and destroyed by an organized state campaign waged by a national political police force, the FBI, which had, was subjected now, then as it is not now, to no constitutional restraint. Um, people were framed on <coughs> ridiculous uh, charges, uh, sabotage of uh, printing presses took place, blackmail of advertisers, uh, blackmail of distributors. Um, uh, it, you can read, John Wiener once wrote a very good account of what happened, how the, how the state took its revenge on, on this um, independent press. And it's worth reading partly to avoid, as I say, the temptations of nostalgia. It's also worth remembering, in fact, one must never forget that what is <coughs> vacuously <coughs> referred to by almost everybody in the press as the war on drugs. And when you hear that this war on drugs is run by a czar, another uncritically repeated term that is in the vocabulary of every hack journalist, when you hear it's run by a czar, you ought to know all there is to know about it. But people say, who's the drug czar these days? One, should we have a new drug czar? As if begging for chains to be laid upon them. Well, if you beg, you'll get. Uh, anyway, the, the, that, this war on drugs um, is the last real vivid present legacy in our midst of the Nixon years and the Nixon administration, and that it had its uses in the repressing and forestalling and foreclosing of dissent. Now, we can't get, therefore, any of that back, and we can't run on rage and um, contempt and obscenity all the time anyway. I know. I've tried. You can do it quite a lot of the time, but it, it's, it can lead to burnout, I warn you. And in the long haul, you may need some other stuff as well. But try and conserve such rage and contempt and hatred as you can. Um, but we ought anyway to remember, and I, I wanted to try and fix in our minds for this, this meeting, the time when the word alternative was a really honorable title and dearly bought and hard won and bearing some very honorable scars. And we should dip our flag and pause and salute. Um, our traditions. So when I came back to the United States a few years later, I decided that it was for me and I wanted to immigrate and I, I landed um, in New York with my cardboard suitcase and a promissory note from the Nation magazine which just as I was going through customs I noticed hadn't actually been signed. <laughs> uh, I didn't mention money. Um, it was the first weekend, it was the weekend of the founding conference of the Writers Union which I attended. There was a panel I was put on with Studs Turkle and Calvin Trillin, among others, the Studs and Bud show. It was a good baptism of fire. And some of the, a lot of the discussions were about what's happening to the independent local press. And somebody got up and said, and I'll never forget it, he complained that in his town in upstate New York, I remember, I can quote it exactly, he said, all our readers are being sucked off by the shoppers. And I thought, have I come to the right country or the wrong country? <laughs> I didn't understand the, the argo of local um, <laughs> distributive uh, arrangements in those days. But it made me think, made me think then, it makes me think now. Um, and one of the things it makes me think is this, the adage or saying or old saw or standby silly remark, all politics is local, is one of those platitudes, a bit like think globally, act locally. Incidentally, have you ever tried that the other way around, ever tried thinking locally and acting globally? It makes no more sense the other way. <laughs> That's consoling and deceptive, and it's deceptive precisely because it's consoling. It's a trap, in other words. Um, just as a lot of national level writing is done with a very provincial 
mentality to it. I'll instance most recently something I wrote about myself. Um, when the Clinton-Gore administration claimed to be taken completely by surprise by the Indian nuclear explosions and said, well, we wish the CIA had told us these were coming, every single journalist in Washington swallowed it right away, never asking themselves, why is it that very often you find that a government would rather admit to ignorance so great that it would be almost impeachable than the contrary, which would involve, if knowledge would involve the admission of some responsibility. They don't mind looking stupid when the alternative is looking wicked. Didn't even ask themselves, could this be true? Um, and, of course, everyone likes a free kick at the CIA, which is now sort of authorized, okay, permitted target, so everyone agreed to write the story exactly as the White House press office gave it out. It was an intelligence failure, we'll try and do better next time. What if it wasn't an intelligence failure? What if it's true as it takes two phone calls to find out? One phone call in the case of my friend Nora Bustani. The Pakistani Prime Minister, Nawaz Sharif, had written to Clinton six weeks before those tests, personally, hand-delivered letter saying, Mr. President, what are you going to do about India's impending nuclear test? And just to make assurance doubly sure, the Pakistani Foreign Minister had written to Madeleine Albright in exactly the same terms on the same day, saying, we're gravely concerned about the impending nuclear tests in the Rajasthan Desert. What is the American attitude? Silence will seem like acceptance or indifference. Well, then, okay, so we ring up, we find out, some of us do. It's still not in the mainstream papers. Um, so do, do you confirm you've got those letters? Short pause, yes, okay. We did get those letters. Well, what did you do with them? Well, we passed them on to the CIA. So that six weeks later, they could say the CIA hadn't told them about the test, and every, every journalist in the country would run with their story. It's very easy to set off a wrong hair and get everyone to follow it, just as um, any a small town provincial manipulator can do with some uh, rube uh, press. That's what I mean by a national mentality. Um, a national, excuse me, a national, national level story, an international, a global story, still covered in a provincial, small down way. And just as I say, with this national level writing done with a provincial mentality, so there's no reason why local writing can't aspire to be global. One of the great stories of the last year, it seems to me, of the last few months, in fact, but it's been building for a long time, is that in spite of an announced congressional cutoff on such activity, the United States Special Forces were training the Indonesian Special Military and Political Police. And it's some months now since Megawati Sukarnaputri, the leader of the Indonesian opposition, wrote an open letter to our great president and leader of the free world saying, I should like to know for one thing, against what enemy these troops are being trained and these special police forces. The Indonesia is threatened by nobody. It has no external foe. It's threatened by no invasion. It, it, indeed, it rather tends to invade other countries, such as East Timor. Good question. Now, those troops were being trained for a long time in the United States. And the people who trained them were being trained for a long time in the United States. That must have been happening outside somebody's little town somewhere. And it seems to me a shame and a reproach that the story was missed. It was missed because people were not looking for it. Uh, the stories do not present themselves. There has to be a suspicion that the government is not on the level. Now, you have to be able to think of your own government and your own state as potentially hostile, as perhaps unwilling to tell or economical with the truth. And you have to keep the powder of your rage and contempt in a permanently dry condition. It's the same with all writing, as a matter of fact. William Faulkner was able to describe really the whole of the human condition by focusing only on a small hermetic, mythical uh, county in, in the Deep South. Um, and now we have as president and leader of the free world a uniquely cheap, small town, small time character who incubated his political style over many, many, many years in a small state. And it seems to me that uh, newspapers or magazines that consider themselves to be local and alternative should have been able to present us with some early warning clues about the Clinton narrative, the Clinton MO, the Clinton style, and the Clinton one hand washing the other. I went down to Arkansas myself during that election campaign to try and see what the alternative press had on file. It was pretty thin, I've got to tell you. Um, and that was, a, it seems to me, that's an intelligence failure. We should have had early warning. And here I think the failure is cultural. Despite the fact that the large majority of Americans live either in major conurbations or in suburbs, and that an increasingly large number of Americans live in effect in the international and global economy, and it barely matters what passport they hold or citizenship they hold as to how they actually operate, there is still a tremendous cultural lag whereby in politics a politician feels they must stress small town, hick, roots. 
what Sylvia Plath calls in the bell jar some manic depressive Hamlet, um, such as, for example, Hope, Arkansas, or Nowhere, Nebraska, or wherever it was that Robert Dole claimed to have come from and rushed back to revisit. This uh, small town routine uh, is, I think, this mantra is both an anachronism and a curse. And it brings with it um, a, a petty and unimaginative mentality. And I think it's particularly incumbent on those who feel that they are grassroots, another phrase that re requires interrogation and is used always as a, as a cliche and always as a rather warm and fuzzy one, uh, to, be, to be very much on their guard against this temptation. Now, I was um, asked to judge the prizes of you all in a couple of categories. Um, and did do so, and I've got uh, some observations on this too. First, there are far too many damn prizes in the journalistic profession. Uh, we're much too keen on giving each other awards. Um, this is, happens at all levels of the trade, in radio, television, and print. It's like party favors or a caucus race in Alice in Wonderland. Everybody's got to get something. No one must feel left out. I think this, this is a weed that uh, is spreading much too, much too fast, and um, uh, prizes should be awarded much more sparingly. And one of the curses, of course, is they have to be awarded every year. And it won't be true that everyone ought to win a prize for journalism every year. If you award them every year, it'll mean every year someone gets one who re doesn't really deserve it. And I can tell you in some papers, it's really bad, because if you have won a prize above a certain level, you're practically unfireable. And uh, there's a sort of log jam and clog up further up the pipe of people who once won a prize and now cannot be flushed out. Um, that's the first thing. Um, there is an upside, actually. In my opinion, probably quite a lot of mainstream papers would do no investigative reporting at all, wouldn't maintain even a team for it if they didn't think they might get a Pulitzer. But who wants a Pulitzer? When Murray, when Murray Kempton got his, I sent him a letter saying, I thought no less of him for doing so. <laughs> um, second, there was a lot too much small time. I don't mean small town, but small time emphasis in the stories. At a time when, after all, most mainstream papers, if not all, are more and more stressing that they cover the local stuff, that they do the details, that they, they're, they're out there in the burbs. The LA Times is always saying, you know, you, we're much better than the Orange County Register at doing the, you know, the local story. It's not enough just to be local. Um, and third, uh, too many of them were written, and this is my main point, were written as if they would like to have been accepted by the metro section of a mainstream paper, and indeed could have been. And in fact, if I had them as printouts and not on the reprinted page, I could have easily mistaken them for that. Now, to be alternative, you have to be able to avoid the debased and the deadening style, um, the, the leaden, pre-digested language of the consensus. If you find you've said, when you're investigating some local puke or national puke, questions remain, or that the rumors about him, which are never rumors, by the way, uh, they're always true, uh, <laughs> and it's always worse than you suspected, are, uh, if you find you said that these rumors are disturbing, watch the hell out. In my opinion, it's just a theory, it's only a theory, but the cliches are actually waiting inside the keyboard for you. They're there already. <laughs> They're programmed in. You just have to put your fingers on them, and they leap right there into the cortex and bang out onto the paper again. They're lurking. Watch out for them. Keep a stick by you. Whack them like snakes. Hit them over the head. Don't find that you've said, don't find you've said questions remain. Or, um, friends say, but critics charge. Um, this is a great New York Times one. I always think yeah, critics charge, but friends say. Um, now, back to those greedy, uh, swallowing uh, shoppers, by the way, before we forget them. Um, there's a lot of criticism of the alternative press I've read. There's a rather in interesting piece in The Nation this week, which some of you may already have read about the state of the alternative press. A lot of criticism for accepting money for advertisements. Well, whatever next. Um, I was shocked to discover this had been going on. I, we wouldn't have put up with that at the Great Speckled Bird. Um, I think this is just a stupid false issue uh, uh, raised by pious people who have no real interest in kicking any, any bottoms at all. There's no conflict of interest involved. In any way, conflict of interest is not in our society the problem. The problem is the ghastly, gruesome, enforceable harmony of interest that we're all expected to feel as if society was a bloody family um, and that the whole and that the whole of America would one day be one great big enjoyable Disneyland that's the future that's being 
prepared for you, and there'll be no conflicts of interest there, you can bet. Don't worry about the conflicts of interest and be proud of the alcohol ads and the tobacco ads and the sex ads too. You should be proud of doing the ads that no one else wants. That's part of being alternative. It would just be nice if you tried to produce papers that read more as if they were written under the influence of these things. <laughs> What you've got to be on your guard against is not uh, pressure from the delinquent ads, in other words, but from the respectable ones, from normal commerce and okay received opinion. Now here, I declare an interest. I have a friend called Dan Perkins, known to some of you as Tom Tomorrow, who's a very good cartoonist who shows no interest, it seems to me, at all in becoming domesticated. And some of you run him, and more of you should, and some of you don't run him anymore because he ran a rather witty cartoon showing the Baroque outlines of a Roman orgy, um, in a, which is his own rather clever adaptation, a reproduction of a classical picture, in order to give his opinion of the, the Washington Lewinsky blowjob fest. And the Oklahoma Gazette wouldn't, would run it, but its publisher and some people in the local community wouldn't have it. And here's what the local community leaders thought. Oklahomans for Children and Families, OCF, is lucky in having a man called Bob Anderson as its leader. Um, and he, when asked if the cartoon appealed to his prurient interests, you have to be asked that if you're going to go through the absurd rodimontade of testing for obscenity, which you shouldn't do. Shouldn't allow the first step of that inquiry to begin, but never mind. Anderson said that it didn't, but that he thought it might appeal to others. That, by the way, is the definition of pornography. Um, otherwise, if that wasn't true, the censor would have to be the most corrupt man in the country because he'd be the one who'd be forced to read it. Um, and we couldn't have a corrupt censor. Now, could we? But, he thought, he mused, it might teach a girl to try oral sex with another girl, or someone might say, I haven't tried anal sex. It might turn someone else on. Now, this deeply distressed and distressing man <laughs> isn't worth a moment's consideration, right? He's absurd and sinister on his face and needs devoted professional help and some expensive <laughs> operations. But no, he has it all his own way. The publisher of the, of the paper, of the Oklahoma Gazette, is a person called Bleakley or Blakely. And he says, musing again, had I been asked about running the cartoon in question, I would have said not to run it. Not because it was obscene, but because a significant number of our readers would have found it offensive Mistakes in judgment sometimes occur. Measure us by how we respond to the lessons we learn, not by the mistakes we make. This is a love slave, right? This is getting really seriously indecent. <laughs> now, because he is a lawyer and because he has contracts with the school board and so on, I won't give you the whole story. The, uh, they not just apologize and grovel, but they cry before they've been hurt. And the cartoonist, Paul, doesn't look as if Tom is going to be in that paper again. I say that's an absolute disgrace. Don't be a journalist if your intention is to be inoffensive. Inoffensive is a synonym for innocuous, harmless. I risk everything and say emasculated. Uh, perhaps I should say eviscerated. Um, whose ambition is it to be that? Um, let them go to another profession. There are plenty of professions in this great country that welcome such people. Journalism is not one of them. I think that uh, everyone should run that cartoon, every, every, the alternative syndicate. The ANA, if it has any meaning, should be enabled to call a meeting of its members and say everybody runs that cartoon in solidarity. And everyone backs up the editor and telling Mr. Bleakley Blakely um, a couple of home truths. But no, you see, there's, there's an easy surrender. Now, if you'll surrender that quickly, uh, where are you different from any Chamber of Commerce dominated uh, local newspaper? I think it's a disgrace, and I think people should look into their into their hearts and their consciences and see if there isn't something they could do about it. In contrast, there's someone, is Mr. William Furry here? I just also wanted to, Mr. Furry, I wondered if you could be a real person, because you sounded a bit as if you could be an R. Crumb character. <laughs> but um, faced with similar pressures in Illinois, he wrote, uh, he wrote like this, and this is a bit more like it. He says, ironically, often the introduction to a bad sentence, ironically, but not in this case. <laughs> Illinois Times has taken the high road in covering the sex scandal stories, not once reporting on or commenting aloud or making light of them since the Monica Lewinsky story broke in December. Instead, we let this modern world speak for us. That's Tom's cartoon strip. Reducing the whole media circus to a cartoon, which is about as close to the truth as we could get. If that offends you, 
If you are obsessed with knowing what politicians are screwing around with whom, instead of which ones are selling the country and your children's future downriver, perhaps you should crawl back underneath the rock of mainstream media. If you can't stand the light of day, get out of the sun. Bravo, Mr. Ferry. Very good. That's the, that's the stuff to give her. And if I went out of the sun, um, because the light uh, and the sun, as you know, as I've already said, <laughs> uh, heat and light are very closely related. So let us not vindicate the great Samuel Clements when he said um, that the great glory of the country was um, that it had a First Amendment guaranteeing um, absolute freedom of expression and the prudence never to uh, resort to it. Um, intimidation, <laughs> intimidation should not be that easy in a country where we are at any rate told there is nothing to fear and where certainly nobody who stands up to a, a local bully and public opinion is often much harder to, alleged constructed public opinion is often much harder to face down than a coalition of advertising interests. But at any rate, no one's going to go to jail yet for this or lose their job or their house forever or have their children go on the streets, though we have to sometimes measure ourselves against the countries, some of them very near to us, some of them intimately affiliated with our own government, where that is the risk of journalism, and try and be worthy of being called the colleagues of those people too. Otherwise, there's always the law. Um, but there is, some, there is quite a lot of fear in America all the same, and it, it, it depresses me when people say, well, what are the great causes these days? It seems to me extraordinary that people will say that, that there's no, there's no crusade to undertake when uh, all liberties, every liberty guaranteed by the Constitution evaporates right away if you can be accused of smoking the wrong kind of cigarette. That people go around in fear also of getting ill, of becoming sick, or having any of their loved ones become sick. That without anyone voting on it, or even being allowed to debate on it, uh, see a forthcoming, uh, soon to be published major essay by my humble self on the uh, cockroach capitalism of the HMO, industry, which nobody asked for, nobody voted for, and everyone's got, and which is destroying the practice and ethics of medicine and, uh, and spreading terror of illness across a free country. Um, and let me just tell you, there's a local story and a national story right there in every town in these great United States. Or meekly submitting to being frisked and asked stupid and intrusive questions at the airport, you practically need a passport now to take an internal flight to the United States and nobody voted for that. Urine tests, lie detector tests that can be imposed on people at work at any moment. My standard here of courage, resistance and Lutheran, uh, here I stand, defiance is um, fat boy Schultz. Um, George Schultz, Secretary of State, once uh, major uh, chairman of the Bechtel Corporation, who said he wouldn't take a lie detector test and nobody could make him. And he, he would be ashamed of any employee who would. Well, I think it would be reasonable if we set as our standard of courage and uh, martyrdom and uh, push me no further than this and don't tread on me that no one in this room will agree to be less courageous than the bulbous figure of the former chairman of Bechtel. <laughs> I think we could all work with that. Uh, but um, I'm not absolutely sure that we can say that, so maybe we should hold our laughter. Now, alternative means can only mean either telling people what they don't want to hear or <clears throat> what they don't already know. It is impossible to find out in advance for our profession anything worth hearing from a focus group. It may be true for marketing the focus grouping works. It may be true for the franchising of our debased political campaigns that uh, it's good to know in advance what people want or what people think. But in our profession, any flirtation with polling or focus grouping is already creative and professional death because it is our whole job to tell people things they don't already know, make them feel things they haven't already felt, tell them things they haven't already heard. There is no way of finding out in advance, in other words, what we should be doing. That's why our job is worth it. That's why it's worth a good person giving their life to. That's why that must be resisted. Anything that, anything that has any truck with that is by definition not alternative. That's why people, self-employed, working for no one in particular, like the great Seymour Hersh, who you just heard, or like Washington's only really serious resident historian, who's Kitty Kelly. Um, <laughs> no, I do not jest. Someone who really did um, take on, really went loaded for bear, went for big game, and brought it down and brought it home three times on the, on the trot. That's not bad for a lifetime. Um, or the late, great I.F. Stone, who was, I'm proud to say, a friend and a mentor of mine, who used to say, materializing my point about the provincial and the national, the Washington Post, that's our local sheet. Um, I don't know why they don't give it away, by the way. Um, 
Uh, it said, is he is a really great newspaper. You never know on what page you're going to find the front page story. Um, <laughs> Being alternative, in other words, is, a, is an exercise of the, of the intellect as well as the aesthetic. It's a science as well as an art. It's something you are, not something that you do, though it's something that you do as well. And the crucial thing is, as I say, and as I began by saying, not to find yourself borrowing the stale language of the, of the commercial and the consensus, and being ready at all times to stand against the healing process being ready at all times when you hear people say, well, we're against the politics of division, to reply, but politics is division by definition. Uh, being willing, in other words, to promote and sow and spread and celebrate hatred and division. Thank you. I'm all yours. I, I have no members of the immediate family here, so I, you may not think it's invidious if I recognize questioners, but maybe someone would like to do it for me. Well, if there are no questioners, the question's moot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the Richard says it's okay if I take questions. But as I say, ah, sir. Is there anything the government does about which you feel in any way comfortable? Um, I was asked if there was anything the government did about which we can feel in any way comfortable. I feel there may be a hook somewhere inside that bait. <laughs> uh, but, <clears throat> well, actually, you know, um, I discovered when doing my piece on HMOs that uh, one of the things about this health service, health system, excuse me, a health racket that leaves nearly 20% of Americans uncovered that, that one is surprised to find conservatives not minding about is that it it's forces some people to stay on welfare because if you are on welfare you're an automatic Medicaid recipient and Medicaid is better than quite a lot of the HMOs now and it's also much cheaper and the government manages to deliver that service you know it's not many frills but re reasonably efficiently and effectively and comprehensively. I think it also does quite well with the mail I don't think it's bad that you know for that for 37 cents or the 32 so 32 cents you can get something hand-delivered the other side of the country in a couple of days. I think that's good service. Um, what I don't think, um, this may just show my age, I mean, it's, it's partly because of the time when I was uh, growing up in the 60s, what the, the main thing that one learned, and it's once you've learned it, you never unlearn it, is that all these people in the, uh, in the uh, ministries and the uh, planning rooms and the skunk tanks and so on around Washington don't, don't know any more than you do. They're, they're, they're bluffing. They're getting through the day the same way as you are, wondering how it's going to play out. They don't, they, their power is meaningless, and their knowledge is pretty empty and, and scanty. And they, to cover this up, they lie all the time. And so, um, how could it be otherwise? I mean, how likely would it be that the people in charge were there because they knew better than you, or were better people? I mean, very unlikely indeed. Yet how much uh, of what they say is repeated uncritically as the news? Because they said it was the news. The spokesman said it yesterday, it's on the front page. Well, let's make it easier for them if we can. Andy. Hello. Uh, you came. I did. Um, Comrade from Pittsburgh. A lot, of, um, a lot of people who put out even these papers, even alternatives, even who would put out or not put out Dan Perkins' cartoons are concerned about what kids may see, because they could pick this up at the supermarket with anyone else. You're a father and a journalist, and I wonder if you'd comment on um, us constraining or restraining what we put in the paper because kids might see it. Ah, uh, yes. Um, do, first of all, did you bring the Pittsburgh Penguins hockey puck? I left. <laughs> what? Um, and the Mary, uh, I, uh, the, the Mary Lemieux signature is back in the hotel, unfortunately. Oh, okay. I don't know. Um, well, in that case, I'll give you an answer. Um, a lot too much is done in this country in the name of protecting children. I mean, in other words, I think a lot of grown-up life, so to speak, is being infantilized in the name of protecting children. I, my, one of my flags goes up straight away when I read that something has to be done to protect the kiddie wings. This is partly from a rooted objection I have to being treated like one, um, which is happening more and more to me. I mean, go to the airport, 
Never mind showing a photo ID. Did you pack your own bags? <laughs> no, uh, I got a chap who does that for me. Um, Aha, uh -huh. no, federal law says it's a, it's a criminal offense to try and be funny at this point, okay. Well, um, did anyone give you anything to bring to the airport today? Yeah. Who's going to see it? It's, it's ridiculous. And it's also, obviously, it's, it's clearly dulling the minds of the people who are in charge of security. It's positively dangerous. Yet it's enforceable at law, right? And this is all treating adults like children. But not in the name of protecting the kids, um, but still. Um, the internet is, they want to police the internet now to protect the children. They want to do all kinds of things to protect the children. I say the hell with it. Most, the, the children I know uh, all know a great, a great deal more than I knew at their age. I get asked questions by my son that I wouldn't have known to ask my father, let alone dad. I'm impressed. I think, um, I think they may have a much better time than we did as a result. <laughs> Getting rid of certain of the burdens of innocence. And it, it goes to the national obsession with innocence. I read the other day that Frank Sinatra's life was a narrative of America's loss of innocence. The time before that, it was Robert Redford's film quiz show that testified to the country's loss of innocence. I've, I'm doing a piece on this. America's innocence was lost in the Civil War, in the Spanish-American War, in the First World War, at the, in, during the Depression, at Hiroshima, at Nagasaki, in Vietnam, by McCarthyism and at Watergate, at least. This is a virginity that grows back with incredible speed. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm against the infantilizing and the presumptions of innocence that go with it. And as a journalist, anyway, I operate on the presumption of guilt, which I think is the only presumption our profession can bring to its labor. So I'm as quick as anyone else to, to um, protest, and I have often when video stores or uh, news agents or convenience stores stack the really rough stuff at children's eye level. You should see me do it. I've, I've got people to move things really quickly um, and without threatening to bring in the law, though I would certainly have done it. And a law against um, that kind of display is easily enforced or a local, local ordinance. That is absolutely never what the people who claim to be speaking for our children are on about. Never, ever, ever, ever. What they want is to get Nabokov and Tom tomorrow. That's what they want. And they, that's what they must not be allowed. And they must not be allowed the first presumption of their of their onslaught, which is that their real interest is in protecting the young. Their real interest is in, why, after all, why don't they call for prayer in the trains? Or prayer on the stock exchange, right? Or prayer in the armed, compulsory prayer for the armed forces? Or in the boardroom, somewhere where, if it does any good, which I don't think, I think like holy water, it may not do any good, it doesn't do any harm. Um, but if it did do any good, it might really come in handy. No, they want it in the schools. Why do you think they want it in the schools? Because they want a captive audience and they want an audience they can mold and they can form and they're not going to be allowed to have it. And we're going to tell them to, to um, get right out of here every time they try. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, I think I'm the only person in my paper in upstate New York, uh, Syracuse New Times, that has said at office meetings, we should be proud of these sex ads because they're different. Nobody else in our market will run them. Uh, but yet there seems to be a constant push to mainstream all this stuff uh, with the, the vague thought that if, uh, you know, if we just show this, the, the uh, exotic dancers with head and shoulders instead of their entire bodies that somehow we'll get the big department store ads or something, which never seem to materialize. But how do you argue against this, this continual mainstreaming? Advertising departments wanting to write advertising stories, stroking the advertisers rather than, you know, really going out and doing something. Well, this is the shoppers again, isn't it? Look, I mean, I don't think being alternative doesn't mean you have to say that no compromise with the readership kind of thing at all. Um, and everybody knows that there are economics to publishing. And, for example, the only reason why um, uh, a lot of people read what I read is because I write for Vanity Fair. Okay, now, I never get any bother from the advertising, but we have a lot of ads. And if we never get any bother from it. We don't allow any of it. Actually, probably because we're strong enough, we wouldn't, no advertiser would dare, I don't think, for one thing. We can turn ads away. Um, so obviously, and this is what I meant earlier by burnout and the long haul, uh, you're much more likely to survive if you're economically sound. It's a responsibility to be solvent, in my opinion, if we're going to do journalism. No, there's no great virtue to poverty and indigence. I said goodbye to all that a long time ago. <coughs> um, and I'm now so rich I hardly know what to do with it all. Uh, but my hate is still pure. Um, 
Yeah. And I think, I, I, I don't know, I never have conversations with the advertising people. At the, at the old New Yorker, the advertising department was on a different floor which didn't connect by the same elevator. <laughs> they weren't allowed to talk to each other. In fact, if, if met on the street, an av a member of the um, m uh, business division was not allowed to compliment a New Yorker writer on a story. That was considered a great breach of etiquette. They weren't supposed to know each other. Um, fine, as long as the people in the management department and the business department are drumming up some money. But I insist that they do that as well as stay out of my face. Let's get real. Um, I, therefore, I'm probably not the right one to, to advise you about how to strike the balance. But I'm glad to hear you say that you're glad to run deviant advertisements, because deviance and delinquency are of the first importance. But why don't they see that, as, that, that difference as healthy, as good, as uh, what we should be? Well, if they don't, it probably means you're doing something right. We don't want your money because you're selling sex. I mean, to me, I say, go out and get that money and give me a raise. Yes. Uh, you got me. <laughs> you feel the journalist has an obligation to get it right. And I say that yeah. uh, alluding to your remark earlier that all the rumors are true and they're worse than you think they are, except that sometimes they're not. Well, I think, um, I, I do tend to think that most rumors about the powerful are true. Most of them have proved out in my experience. And I do think we have to operate on the presumption of guilt. It makes me angry every time people say, so-and-so has been subjected to trial by media. There is no such thing. We cannot subpoena anybody, okay, nor can we depose anybody, nor very often can we, or even when we can at press conferences, we miss the chance to cross-examine people. And we certainly can't send anyone to jail, more's the pity. So it's masochistic to worry about trial by media. There should be, I wish there was something more like a court of public opinion in this country. Um, and I have big ideas about who it should haul in front of itself. But there isn't, so it's, it's, both, it's funny, it's both masochistic and sort of partly sadistic to say that there is. When there isn't, um, I think it's, it's creepy in other words. If, the, if something is a non-substantiated rumor, then the way to deal with it is as follows. Use the press conference to, to ask the guy, they should be asked. Okay, there are a lot of times embarrassing questions are not asked because access will be forbidden to the person who asks that question. It's very common for press conferences now for people to say, you know, if you, especially to out of town reporters who may want to make an impression back home, if you ask, we'll call on you. You can ask a question and you'll be on the nightly news if you'll make sure it's a friendly one. That's done a lot. They, they should instead use that time to ask the question everyone's been wanting to know the answer to but doesn't want to be the one to ask. That's the job, okay? Now, um, obviously, it's, it's too weary, wearying to go into this business of the internet and Matt Drudge and so on again and again. But, uh, and I don't think Drudge is a journalist. I think he's, I think he's a pimp. I think he's, a, he's, a, he's an operative for undisclosed, not very decorative political interests who simply feed him material. He does no digging. Okay, he's just a conduit. They could have, and they very soon will be able to have a cybernetized version of him. They don't need a human being, they just need the site. They can put their own gunk up there and put it in circulation. And probably they could invent some kind of Truman character to do it, or wag the dog um, asshole, um, as a surrogate figure. But I have to say that what he said in the National Press Club, where I don't think he should have been invited last week, was true. That um, the, the speed by which news can materialize or suggest itself cybernetically has broken the hold of the old news cycle. And that's a good thing, because it used to be that the, there were gatekeepers in Washington on all the newspapers and all the television shows and chat shows, and they would decide what the news was. And if people didn't want something to be news, everyone knew that the White House would put it out in the Saturday afternoon release, and all this kind of thing. And that was all clearly understood and part of the rules, and the people who did it went and played golf with the people who put it out. And that's over now. They can't do that anymore. They've lost control. And though some of the things uh, that result from that are, are un unpleasant and vulgar, um, I, I think one mustn't neglect the upside of it. So, let the arbitration of public opinion decide whether something's true or not. What I did not join the profession to do was to know what the rumor is in Washington, and none of my readers know, and keep it to myself. Let them arbitrate it, let them test its credibility. After a while, um, I think Gresham's law could go into reverse. People would, would know immediately what to discard and what to take seriously. But we can't be the ones doing that for them. We, I, I'm not a filter. I'm a transmitter, I hope. Sir. 
Um, you said earlier that divisiveness and polarization are valuable because when you have divisiveness, that's when issues are clarified. But you also hear pundits who are saying that people are growing anesthetized and complacent and uh, they're tired of hearing people whine. Uh, there's a book three years ago called The Culture of Complaint. Everybody's tired of people whining. And also uh, a frequent criticism leveled against the media is that, that the media is great at, at criticizing processes and and ideas, but we're terrible prescribers. Um, first of all, do you see American society growing more complacent? And, and uh, two, if so, do you think there's an antidote anywhere in sight? Gosh, well, was the question audible to, to all? Because it would be somewhat difficult to pray see. It's basically, it's, I mean, it might boil down to saying, is the press any, any better at taking it than it is at dishing it out, would be one of the, your questions, I suppose. And second, what about um, what about the culture in general? Has it become more complacent, while yet sort of more shrill and complaining? It may it, there may be something in the latter point. I think because um, there's certainly no shortage of people regarding themselves as victims, and that's what Robert Hughes's book was about: the culture of complaint. And I thought it was good. There's a lot of self-pity around. There's no question about that. But there isn't very much uh, interest in the predicaments of others, and there isn't, I think, any belief that. Things would get better if anyone really seriously politically complained. The nerve of outrage seems to me at the moment to be somewhat dead. Let's perhaps more hopefully say dormant. I, I, I often wondered what it would take to shock people into action. I mean, just it did seem to me that the, that the news that, in spite of a much delayed and uh, overdue congressional ban on it, that Americans were training with the knowledge of the Defense Department death squads in Indonesia ought to have got people annoyed, but it didn't. Um, part of it is what we call in um, Washington post-Watergate morality. It used to be people didn't believe the government did this kind of thing. They really didn't believe it. They, they, they thought the government was on the level. And when, under the real sledgehammers of evidence, they found that wasn't true, for a while there was a reform movement in Congress and in the press and elsewhere, and you know, a bit of a, a house cleaning. After that, people got cynical, and so when you told them, hey, guess what? politicians are openly on sale in Washington, they'd say, well, so what do you expect? Or wake up and smell the coffee, or some other wised up remark as if, who doesn't know that? That's quite hard to mobilize that, that mentality because it's um, cynical without being enraged or um, hate-fueled to meet my two tests. It is, it is difficult. I predict that there will be a rebellion um, against the um, health exploitation racket. In fact, it seems to be already building. But there's an element, obviously, of self-interest in there as well as of compassion. So we have to keep our powder dry for better days. Now. Uh, you made a reference to focus groups and how that's not really a place for journalists. It made me think of what's happening, uh, what I'm reading about what's happening at LA Times. And I was wondering if you had written anything about that or... Uh, I haven't written anything about the LA Times. Though when I was teaching at the journalism school in Berkeley earlier this year, we did have the editor up there. He came because we sent him such a long letter of complaint about the paper. He came up and spoke to us. It actually, was quite interesting. He, he feels his job is to please. Okay, he wants he wants the readers to like the paper, wants them to feel at home with it, wants it to be easy for them to read, all that kind of thing. You can't. I mean, it, within his own his own uh, what should we call it? His own universe of discourse. He's perfectly correct. Um, I didn't join the profession because I wanted to be liked. Okay. Nonetheless, I've become incredibly popular. I um, <laughs> uh, have more friends than I know what to do with, but not by looking, not by sort of being ingratiating, I hope. <laughs> you be the judge of that, obviously. Um, what can he do? He has to sell the papers. Um, but I think he feels that, as a lot of people do, that it's best if you can to find out what people would like. Now, I don't know, I mean, see how it play out so you're having a conversation with a stranger you've met in a bar or on a plane and you break off and say, excuse me, I've been trying for the last five minutes to make a good impression on you. Would you mind just telling me if I'm succeeding or not? <laughs> well, this has a long way to go before it's cretinous, okay? But that's the method. That is now the method by which politics and business and I'm afraid a large amount of journalism is actually consciously run. I went to a TV focus group thing in Bethesda the other night I was lucky to get a, you know, a mailer thing saying, inviting me, Mr. Te dear, dear Telly viewer, it said, I don't watch television. 
Um, you can shape the future of television in America. It's one of those. So I thought I must, I can't miss this. And, I thought, <laughs> and they showed us. They showed. They offered us various um, tampons and douches and cold sprays and um, inducements to watch uh, some terrible. Uh, uh, I think I may. I think possibly even faked uh, previews. And then a huge question on our buying habits. It was so obvious a ripoff. But everyone in the room acted like a complete zombie. And I thought, this is the pornography of the Democrat. This is learning to hate and despise your fellow citizen. This is watching people behave like absolute cattle. I couldn't bear it. They obediently did everything the MC told them to do. I hung around at the end, and everyone was outraged. They thought they'd been brought there under a false pretense. They were very critical of everything that had happened to them. They a waste of time. They'd never come again. What do they take us for? But the marketing people have walked off with a huge pile of stupid answers that they got just by asking stupid questions. And they'll say that's what the people want. So you count on it. Now, you need a certain fortitude to resist that. Many people in their dreams, that we've all had them. What do we do when the big test comes as a journalist? You know, when the big squeeze is put on you not to tell the truth or be brave. If you haven't had this fantasy, you ought to start thinking about having it. Well, you think it's going to be, you know, the, the swag-bellied sheriff or the pot-bellied uh, tycoon or the great polluter or whatever it might be, but it's much more likely to be someone saying to you after work, it's great stuff you've been doing on that series, but you know, it isn't really playing. The public don't seem to want that at all. P people are bored with this. Now, you try and stand up against that, but much, much more insidious and much, much more to be feared and easily said by someone who says, it's not me, it's just the public seemed not to. You know, the dogs won't eat it. The thing that every dog chows are, like um, the guy who owns the voice, uh, most dreads to hear. The pooches won't go for it. Well, um, there you are. Uh, um, we shouldn't be afraid of that, because we never guaranteed people that what we were going to give them would be what they'd like or what they'd want, let alone that it would reinforce what they already knew or already thought. What are your thoughts on Steve Drill's Steve magazine content? I got a call from someone who was writing a piece about it. And I was very suspicious, I have to say, because I have a feeling that the wrong people are going to like it. This is maybe wrong for me to prejudge it, but one of the assumptions appeared to be similar to the one that Congress came up with in the form of that complete popinjay and jerk, Senator Byrd, former Klansman and fiddle player um, who's a uh, pork stuffer for West Virginia. And he said when, when it was decided that congressional emoluments should be fully disclosed, speaking fees and all that kind of thing, which I think they should, he said, well, then it, well, journalists should be forced to disclose what their speaking fees and other, you know, other emoluments are. And to a lot of people, that seemed like a fair trade. Not a bit of it. I won't hear a bar of that ditty. So certainly not from Senator Byrd, actually not from anybody else either. No. Well, we, we are not running for office. We don't claim to speak for anyone else. We're not charged legally with the same responsibilities, etc., etc., etc. It's none of their business. Okay, we're a different kind of profession, um, and uh, I th the same would be true um, for the attempt made by uh, some people in the Clinton White House. It's, it was aborted, but there was a plan to say, well, how would the sex lives of those who are questioning the president really stack up? Well, suppose they'd gone ahead with that plan, which I know was discussed. So what? You don't have to be pure to ask the question, OK? Um, because you aren't the one who's involved in the conflict of interest or the harmony of interest that is under investigation. I had a feeling from the way the questioning went from this guy from Brill's shop that they were sharing in the assumption that the press should be investigated, OK? And that will appeal to exactly the wrong kind of instant populism. So I'd be on my, I'm very much on my guard against it, and I hope I'm wrong in my suspicions. So. Yes, um, just a, a, an observation and a point of criticism. The dog chow guy, as you call him, helped me start a paper in Orange County where we are blessed, uh, I think as you put it, to have the LA Times in Orange County competing against the Register, neither of which can seem to understand the county that they actually operate in because they're so tied in with the Republicans and the land developers and the uh, exploiters of labor. And so I'm really curious about well, that's how... that's an expression you don't hear enough these days. I think so. I think you're well, right. Um, but um, I'm, I'm curious about why you think we ought to be satisfied with the local coverage we get from a guy like Mark Willis, who runs the Times, 
when it comes to local issues, because they are, they are exactly as you suggested before, the worst elements of provincial journalism with the worst aspects of the national. This is a huge multinational corporation that pretends to be, as they put it in their advertising, on our side. <gasps> and yet, uh, the, the side they mean they're on is the side that's kicking us in the ass every day. Yes, on our side, isn't it terrible? I, I, I check for my pulse every morning um, to see if it still pisses me off that the New York Times has that box saying all the news that's fit to print, and it's, every day it still does. <laughs> and, then I check, and then I check to see, is the Washington Post still running horoscopes? Yup, it still is. Uh, so then I feel braced for the day, you know, the, the contempt glands kick in again. <laughs> um, and on, on your side, it used to be the slogan of Channel 7 here, seven on your side. What? Horse feathers. I didn't in the least mean to suggest you should be satisfied. What I said was, it depressed me at a time when the proud boast of the local major outlets is how local they are and how, how grassroots and domestic is their emphasis, that so many of the uh, prize entries I read, and I presume that people were sending me what they thought was the sparkier stuff, could have appeared in the metro section of a major paper without much alteration or perhaps with none, and seemed to be written either under the influence of it subliminally or perhaps with a view to one day landing a job there. I mean, that seemed to me to be depressing. Probably 80 or maybe 90 percent of the papers in here uh, run a single feature called The Real Astrology. I'd love to hear your feelings on that. Golly. Well, I think it's probably, I think it, it's, it's not the most sinister form of current superstition, and we are going to be facing a tsunami of, uh, of nonsense of this kind as the millennium gets nearer, I think, of, of Nostradamus recyclings and all kinds of burblings from the beyond and all kinds of that thing. <laughs> but, but astrology is, I think, the most feeble-minded of the superstitions, and um, sinister only in the sense that it's the most solipsistic, just as the religious fool believes that he is the object of God's creation and was created, you know, is so loved and created for purpose, and even supervised all the time. That's how much he counts. And by the way, this is what's known as modesty among Christians. I don't understand it. <laughs> but I can see why they call themselves a flock, all right. Um, uh, the, the fact is that it's been discovered a long time ago that not only is the universe not um, man-centered, it isn't even earth-centered, it isn't even sun-centered. It probably doesn't go around anything very much. No. Obviously, the solipsists and the narcissists and the falsely modest are depressed to find this, so much better to think that a star map that was drawn before Neptune, Pluto, and Uranus were discovered uh, has the remaining planets orbiting uh, to find out uh, what your chances are of getting laid. <laughs> I would not, I certainly, if I was, I, I, would, I would never refuse an advertisement of any kind. Um, and I.F. Stone, in his weekly, was always very firm about that. He never took ads, didn't want them, but he would always criticize even his favorite local papers if they did refuse objectionable advertisements. I think it's a matter of principle. I don't think, I don't agree with the Buckley Supreme Court decision on political money as given being First Amendment exercise. I think that's obscene. But I think advertising is free speech. So, but I, I wouldn't run an astrology column. I just wouldn't. And I remember when the um, Fleet Street paper where I worked once for my since I've done a lot of work at the yellow end of the trade in my time, and I dare say that it shows, um, it was decided to, to fire the astrologist. And I always wished I was the editor who wrote the sacking letter, which began, as you will no doubt have foreseen. <laughs> <laughs> Fleet Street was a very heartless place in those days. <laughs> That's how I'd get rid of mine if I ever uh, inherited an alternative paper. Yes. Since the mainstream press and especially the dailies and the TV stations are very much a part of this harmony of interest you've talked about, along with the chambers of commerce and the mm -hmm. developers and the government, why shouldn't the deals they make and what they accept for the sharing of their wisdom and from whom be subject to some scrutiny as well? And is, a lot of the papers here, mine included, do press criticism and do take a great interest in that kind of information and think it's a value uh, to share with people. Sure. Is this, is this about the Brill business, you mean? Well, I'm thinking more if Brill is going to do that, then no, fine, but I have a feeling what not. What you said about, about not wanting to hear a bar of the ditty about um, 
what what journalists take, who they take it from, what their speaking fees are, and in a larger, no. in, in a broader sense, then what do you think of uh, James Fallows? No, I tell you what, I, I'll give you an example. I did a thing with James Fallows uh, on on um, PBS Frontline during the last election about the press and the election, how it covered it, and he had his critique, which was. The press is overpaid, it takes too many outside speaking engagements. He particularly went after Stephen Cokie Roberts. Um, and he fired Roberts from uh, US News on this basis. And ABC, if that's what she works for, um, stopped Miss Roberts from going to so many gigs. And I had my take on why the press was covering the election badly. And my take actually was that um, you could never make an honest uh, confrontation with the political money racket since all that political money is raised to be spent on the media after all. They don't raise it to keep it. They raise it to give to the, to the, to the mass media. So that's why uh, there was a real problem. And there were other problems too. But there was also a problem with the language and the, the assumption you know, that we made that uh, the primaries were really primaries, that the conventions were really conventions when they were media events set up only to please the profession. And therefore, it was wrong to complain that they were theatrical and staged because it was at the behest of journalism that that was done. Ted Koppel wanted a, an uncontroversial, smooth convention in San Diego, and when he got it, he walked, because there was nothing to cover. But that's an irony. OK, now, so I don't care if Kirky Roberts goes to the National Association of Whatnot and gets some money on the side. I would mind if she kept it a secret, but I don't think you can keep such an appearance a secret. And Jim Warren of the Chicago Tribune has done a very good sort of count of all that. It's worth knowing. But um, the other day, the Promise Keepers came to town, and there was a big to-do about it. And then, I, for once, I watched the show the next day that discussed it, and it was the one that Roberts and Donaldson are on. And um, someone said, well, it looks like these people have a political agenda. They went back and forth about what it meant, the Promise Keepers. And uh, they, you know, they're not just here to be good, good guys, but they have this agenda of patriarchy and fundamentalism and so forth. And Cokie Roberts, who was anchoring it, as I remember, said, well, but they just say, Sam, or whoever it was, um, that they've come here to witness and be, and be better people, and I just say we should take them at their own face value. Now, I would have fired her for saying that. Not because of what I think about the promise keepers, but because a very good definition of what a journalist is not is someone who says, you take the phenomenon at its face value. I would have called her up and said, I don't care how much money you've taken from me. You're fired. Okay, walk, pack. You're out of the building by the end of today. You are not in our profession anymore. But, but now that, you see, is never, that is never going to be attacked. That's fine. The top of the news is what the press spokesman said yesterday. Fine. No one's going to be criticized for acting as a megaphone or a stenographer for frauds or professional liars, anyway. People who come on to tell you that they're trying to put the best face on things. Then you say what they say is literally the news. No, that's where the problem is. The other stuff is all a distraction. And there's no reason why, uh, uh, I mean, I go a long way with Ben Bagdikin and, and Mark Miller and the other people who've written about the extreme conglomeration of ownership and so forth. But nonetheless, there is no reason why a person working in those uh, milieu can't write and produce a perfectly decent story or, or item if they have any, any guts at all. Okay, they, they, they must not use that as their excuse for not doing it. But, the, but a lot of pabulum is produced by people who are under no pressure to do it. They, they cannot make you be a megaphone. Okay, that's what you have to, you have to police yourself, not other people. In other words, this is what I'm saying. And watch for the cliche count and the, and watch for the consensus level in your bloodstream and all that. Really watch out, because it can kill you. Yes? I think you should know that Cooper Roberts was the keynote speaker of uh, this group uh, several years ago. But what did you so, get paid? Do you even happen to know? <laughs> uh, probably a lot of money, so that's the kind of organization to apply to that Mr. you're Carpel dealing to find with. Out about that. Um, but um, I, I think you made a very good point about awards being um, <coughs> party prizes. And uh, tomorrow, uh, the orgy of uh, self congratulation here um, will be. Um, uh, indicative of that. My question to you, though, is um, you say Matt Drudge shouldn't have been invited to the National Press Club um, as, if it, as, if, as if the National Press Club was a sacred institution. Um, look at the membership of the National Press Club. Look at the hacks that are in the National Press Club. Why in the world shouldn't Matt Drudge be invited? Well, actually, you're quite right. I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have put it. It was pompous of me to put it in that way. Um, 
He has every right to be there. Probably fit in like nobody's business. <laughs> I think it was wrong to invite him as, a, as if he was a journalist, as a phenomenon, perhaps. No, it's terrible. I mean, the National Press Club, and really what irritated me was that they continued with him there to have the practice of not, no, no live questions, no one getting up and saying, hey, you, but write them down, pass them along the table to the chairman who painstakingly reads them out in this deferential way. That gives any natural advantage to the platform and is incredibly easy to, um, uh, to manipulate by any speaker. I mean, I, I, the, only, the last time I went to one of those lunches was, I was working for Robert Maxwell at the time, um, a paper called The European that he owned, and he was the guest of honor. So I was invited to the head table. And he was suing the New Republic at that point because of a thing Tom Bauer had written about his scummy dealings. Um, but they, Maxwell was only suing the New Republic as published in London, um, but not in Washington. Because the British libel law makes it much easier to sue in England, as you probably know. So I thought, well, I can't live with myself if I don't do something. So I wrote, I had to write down my question. And I said, Dear Mr. Maxwell, uh, if you're going to sue the New Republic, which is published in Washington, why don't you sue it here and not in London? And what, what's your problem with that? And signed it. And the person at the, um, at the chairing the lunch said, OK, we'll, we'll guarantee to ask him that since you're a head table guest and so on. So I was really interested to see what he'd say. A lot of dull questions were asked. A lot of dull answers were there for duly given. My question didn't come up. I said to the chairman afterwards, what, so what about my question? He said, don't you realize this guy saved the Daily News? And he's our guest. He's a job creator. We can't be mean to him. Well, that's the ethos of the press club. So as that's, it's that sort of thing that allows people like Drudge to spring up like weeds, I expect. So I accept your correction. Sir? I enjoyed your talk immensely. Thank but you. I'm, um feeling a little bit disappointed because I'm not sure you've, 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 you've nailed the question that, that we were sold, that is, you know, are we, worth the, are, are we here sitting here worth the paper we're printed on? How, how do you assess what we do? Well, I don't read you all, but I told you what I read of the, of the prize entries, and in a recent piece I did on the, um, the state of uh, collapse of Washington, D.C., um, which I said was not is a great local story, but it's the nation's capital, so it's a national scandal. I've mean, tried again with my trope about this. It is to do with small town corruption and small town mentality and graft and thug police thuggery and um, filth and uh, incompetence and so on. But it, it is a national disgrace because it's supervised by Congress in a disenfranchised town. Um, and I did say in there that I thought that the city paper they've done a very good job in staying on Barry's case all along, when there was, there was always a temptation, succumbed to by the Washington Post, particularly in the early years, to think of him as um, perhaps deserving of a free pass because he was black, for example, or at least some indulgence, some slack. They never succumbed to any of that, and I thought that was good. So, um, but I, if I came to say, um, if you saw the sign saying Christopher Hitchens will appear at two o'clock and give credit where it is due, I imagine the room would be half empty. I certainly hope so. Uh, one more, I'm told. Sir. Yes, there's been a lot of um, commentary in the Daily Press in the last few days about the forthcoming photo spread of Monica Lewinsky photos in Vanity Fair. And most of it has uh, focused on why on earth she and her now ex-legal team would have made the decision to go forward. The question I have is, uh, why on earth is Vanity Fair running those photographs? And uh, you were talking about pandering um, to the common, common tastes. Uh, what decision process do you think went into that for them? Well, you are addressing the author of the accompanying text. Of that. <laughs> and... And when you read it, you, uh, I also want you to know I wrote all the captions, okay? As well as the sign bit. I'm glad that I didn't bet. All the, everything, all the, uh, every word on that page is by me, including the unsigned bits. And I had to say to Mr. King the other night on his show that I thought um, my long-held theory that one word is worth a thousand pictures um, needed some consideration. I, I thought some attention should be paid to the text, because that explains a lot of the answer to your question. He, that he, he consented to read out a couple of I thought rather well turned uh, sentences. <laughs> what was my astonishment though when he said, but Chris, he calls me Chris, which I can't bear. Um, 
I always call him Mr. King. I don't know the guy. Uh, that's another thing, by the way. People who go on Nightline and say, Ted, again, you already know. No, 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 it's all very bad. <laughs> the, the, the journalistic habit of referring to celebrities by their nicknames, OJ, Die, all that, very Ollie, very bad. Rot, real rot, cretinizing rot, spreads like wildfire. <laughs> he said, but, but Chris, this is, you'll have to be, this is celeb dumb. I was flabbergasted. I was on Larry King to say that celebrity dumb should not be discussed. <laughs> I didn't know what to, I didn't know quite how to handle it. I think I, I said, I chose my words, I hope with care, and I said, well, yes, I think she qualifies. And then I said, I didn't come on Larry King to run down the idea of celebrity, surely. But what I should have said, and uh, it occurred to me afterwards, Ariel Ponce, was that um, celebrity, as we use it pejoratively or mockingly, is, it means someone who's well known just for being well known. Okay, the original definition of Daniel Borstein when he wrote his famous uh, essay on the non event, the media event, the media created event, the thing that wouldn't happen if there were no cameras there. Monica Lewinsky, it seems to me, is not in that category. She is. A, a major player that may be to a large extent inadvertent, though there are certain things I don't think you can do without knowing you're doing them, or by, a, or by accident, or passively. Um, and she has changed the course and shape of American politics and may do so um, more yet. So the fact that we've subsisted until now on a very meager diet of mugshots and old pictures taken from her ID cards and so on seemed to me a shame. It was a good thing to get a, a square look at her. <laughs> and we beat the whole national press on that. Now you wanted to know how this decision was taken. Well, um, I actually don't know all of it, but I know that someone approached Ginsburg, one of our, one of our writers I believe it was, and said, what about it? You know. And he, uh, who after all has a reputation to uphold as one of the great comic characters of this decade, <laughs> said, yeah, why not? It would do her good to have a day out. Herb Ritz, and we said, okay, we'll get you Herb Ritz, we'll get you Malibu. Herb Ritz is a real artist with the camera. We'll get you Malibu, we'll do a shoot. Two lawyers came, including one of her current ones. Daddy came. They watched it all and they signed the model release form. We thought all our birthdays had come at once. <laughs> But it, it, it certainly, it certainly meets, my def it meets my definition of news. And she certainly is not. Um, she's not a celebrity like, um, I, can't, I won't it'd be invidious to think of an example, but she's not a celebrity. She's, she's well known for more than being famous. I think you'll find. So I think we did a bang up job, I really do. And um, see what you think about the text. <laughs> It says, it goes to the no of outrage point, it says that apparently the national consensus is now that what two adults do in the privacy of their own Oval Office is none of the public's business. Think about that. That's where we're at. That's where we've come to. That really is a depoliticized society that believes that. And it's a, that a society this depoliticized must have been very badly served by its journalistic profession, it seems to me. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Hitchens. And I should, uh, regarding that uh, Cokie Roberts issue, I, first of all, I'm happy to confess that she was hired by this group before I was hired, so it was not my decision. Um, but I have, I have been told how much she was paid, and it was a hell of a lot more than you're being paid. Uh, but I can also say that uh, we received a hell of a lot less value. So we appreciate uh, you coming here today. Thanks. Yeah, yeah.